During much of the 20th century, federal funding for development of energy resources and transportation modes fueled the economy and lifestyle of the United States. Travel across America and you'll see signs of this campaign. Dams that utilize the energy of America's rivers, refineries that turn crude oil into petrochemical products, and nuclear plants that harness the power of the atom. For much of the same century, residents of rural Alaska did not receive benefits derived from this national energy development drive. In many rural communities, fuel is still delivered by two or three barge shipments during the year and stored in fuel tank farms. And in many locations, these tanks and the generators they fueled operated at widely differing levels of repair and efficiency. About 10 years ago, uh, we started to have some very real issues with agencies like the U.S. Coast Guard. You had tank farms that were essentially substandard. There's really no other way to describe them. There was rusting in the tanks, there were bad piping systems, and small fuel leaks were very much a part of life. And I believe that closing down would have occurred in the next few years, and our villages, frankly, do not have any viable alternative source of power in the foreseeable future. Energy problems are still widespread in rural Alaska, but a change has begun to evolve over the past couple of years. This is fueled in part by the establishment of the Denali Commission and a growing desire shared by numerous government agencies and private entities to find ways to collaborate effectively and efficiently. I think that Senator Stevens is, is a very um, firm believer in economic development. You can't build a processing facility if you don't have the power to supply the processing facility. Infrastructure is the key to having economic development. More than ever, funding sources are actively striving to empower local communities and to invite them early into the decision-making process. As part of the process to actually build a Denali Commission tank farm project, there has to be a very uh, intricate involvement with the community. Substantial progress has been made to replace aging fuel tanks in various communities throughout the state, and planning is underway to ensure many others receive the same benefit. In addition, efforts are moving forward to upgrade power plants and develop hydroelectric power generation projects. One very important added benefit associated with these projects is a corresponding training effort to protect the public's investment and provide jobs for rural residents. What does all this mean for the residents of rural communities in Alaska? It means that basic heat and light required to sustain life is available. It means families can log on to the internet and school children can have the means to study in comfort. It means snow machines can be used for work and play and planes can fly from village to village. It also means a youth can play his first electric guitar and medical staff can provide life supporting help. In short, it means more of rural Alaska can enjoy many of the same resources so readily available in cities and towns throughout America. The work of the Denali Commission, in concert with numerous state, federal, and private entities, is just beginning. There is much work to be accomplished, but we are better prepared than ever to bring safe and cost-effective energy to all the residents of Alaska.
you know, that concern is how, how long are we able to maintain that facility? Is it going to grow when our needs uh, require it to? Are we going to have enough um, local people employed at the plant? And those are all questions that need to be addressed. But I think overall, everyone's pretty satisfied with it. And I think that they're very supportive, including the commercial fishermen. They realize that in order for them to get a good product out on the market, they got to be fully involved. Their concerns need to be met. And so far from what I've experienced and heard being in the fishery, it seems like this is something that they've been looking for for a long time. Anything else you want to add? Nope. Okay. Fine. Two questions. Can run a couple of cans here? Yeah. So run on. Uh, here, use the old uh, cameras on that. Run, <coughs> run four or five, so you got. Yeah. And what they're going to do is they're going to do a can teardown. And what we're doing there is we, we yeah, don't put them. And uh, so what we made them all do is fill out these charts. And what it is, is you take the, the vacuum and the can, the, the thickness, the width, the body hook, cover hook, and then you, you end up with an overlap. And that's what they have to come up with. The overlap has to be above 40 before you know that everything's in tolerance before we start canning. Different one, different one, different one, too. These are hard because they have their light because they don't have a picture. So they're the ones that pop off. Sure. Right, now what's happening there is there's two sets of rollers in here. 
and, and by, let me show you. And what, what happens is one set of rollers takes the lead and, and rolls, makes the first roll, and then you hear that second end gauge. What that is is the one that's flattening it down and making sure it's down on the cannon, sealing it. So it gets a, a good seal on it. So that's all it does. And also, this is, a vac this is a vacuum chamber here. So what it does is it pulls the vacuum. So when that's cooked, when that, when that goes in the retort, if something's wrong with it, that will puff up. It won't suck down. So that's why you want your vacuum. And then there's all kinds of adjustments on this. You can adjust your body hook and your length of your can. And then you can tear this thing down. And we this other one over here, we got it set up with one pound can. So what I need, six ounce? Yeah, six and a half. And this is, uh, now, this is, are these still, these are still possible fish, aren't they? They aren't the red salmon, are they? These are still possible, right? And then uh, we, we, we just done some uh, strips yesterday. We done some in there. And uh, what, get a can of those strips and let's open it. Here we have a couple of cans that we've done and we opened it up to show you. This is the smoked chum here and this is the smoked king salmon that we done yesterday. You could tell the difference. See the oil content in that? That was just this regular smoked chum there, the smoked king salmon there, the strips. Is this something that might be applicable as a small processing operation, do you think? I think so. I think that would sell real well. Price them. What you're going to do, you, here's your hour time right here. See that there? Okay. Okay, so you want to get that. It's, it's 12.30. So you want to set that on 
You want to have this pin completely out. And move it around to where your hour is. Right about here. 12.30? Okay, now you see there's a little hole in that pin. That pin goes one way. See that little dip in it? I see that. Okay, there's a pin. Okay, go ahead and push that in. See, there's a little sharp needle there that'll go into that chart so it makes it Where turn. Where is it on this side? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. You feel it go on? Oh, I see. Okay. Both sides, so it holds down. Okay, now drop your needle down on your chart. You just push that, that. yeah, because they're real sensitive. So you okay. push it all the way in. Oh, in. Oops. Yeah, they just go oh, in. All, yeah, okay. all the way in like that. Now on your needle's down on your chart, and now as the steam comes on and the temperature rises, this thing will go up. I didn't actually get it right. So it kind of yeah, that, it, it's got to be within two hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, within two hours, the time you're cooking is all it has to be within. So you're fine. Now shut your door on it. Okay, now you come back. Okay, go ahead and... that want to put these plants in, they, they, they want to talk about a million dollars and stuff like that. And I just, it just hurts me because I think, man, you don't need that. Yeah. You spend that money like you're spending your own money. Like if it was your own money, how would you do it yourself, you know? That makes a difference sometimes. Yeah, it does. It? Yeah, because you, you, you want to make sure that that... How long have you had this retort? I've had this uh, for about 12 years. Uh-huh. 12, 14 years we've had it. Yeah, it's retorting this stuff, you know, so. Okay, now we can go ahead. Okay, and here's, here's what you guys are going to do. Okay, now they're hooking up the exhaust system. And what this does is you have to exhaust your air out of this retort when you turn the steam on. And you sort of look and, towards them when you're talking. Okay. As if you're teaching yeah, them. Yeah, all right. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to shut this off. You're going to shut your exhaust off because you're going to bring the steam up in your retort. And what you're doing is you're heating all your cans in your retort, and you're just going to heat them for now. Get them up so it doesn't shock that boiler that much. Now, what you have is your, you've got a mercury thermometer here, which is, coincides with your chart. And the mercury thermometer always has to be at least one degree, or even or one degree higher than your chart, so that you know your mercury thermometer is always right. You want to make sure that you always look at that in, in, over your chart. And the reason why this is built out here, and you see that there's two exhaust systems on this. Vents, they call them. And this, is, this vent here is 1 16th, and the vent over there is 1 8th. And the reason they got an eighth of an inch there, they want air to travel over them, them probes. The probe, one probe is going to run your controller, the other probe is going to run your, your uh, mercury thermometer. And so they want that air moving through there, so there's no, there's no stagnant part of this retort. And then on the top of your retort, they've got another little bleed valve, and it can be smaller then the bleed valve on the side. And that's it. Now what you're going to do is you're going to start to retort up. It's going to go through your controller, but you want just, when you're, when you're exhausting, you want just solid steam going in there. So you're going to come over here, and this is your bypass lever, valve. So what you're going to do is you're going to open your bypass on. Now you're not going through your controller, you're going around it. You're putting solid steam in there. So this is the most critical part for somebody getting hurt is when you're doing this. You don't, you could blow up your boiler if you want over pressure. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna bring that pressure up and then as it gets up to about 18 pounds, you're gonna exhaust it here. Now if you forget to do that, if you walk away from your retort, it just climb right on up and blow this thing up. So what you have to do, well blow your pop valve off because this is your safety valve. But you don't want that to ever happen. So you wanna stand right here when you're doing this. You open it, then when you get it up to about 18 pounds pressure, you're gonna open it up and that exhausts everything. Now you're exhausting all, everything out of there. All the air is coming out. You're going to do that for five minutes. And at the end of five minutes, you're going to sh shut your valve off here first. Then it's, everything's going through your controller. Then you're going to shut your, your valve off here. Then exhaust your valve. You're going to shut that off. 
you're gonna go over and then write down your time when your cook time comes up, which we're cooking at 245 degrees. So it's gonna come up 245 degrees for 75 minutes. Then you start your time there, chart, write that down, chart that, and then your cook time is started. But you're gonna exhaust for five minutes. You wanna make sure when you start exhausting, you walk over, check your, your recording thermometer and make sure that's dropped down and it's come back up so it records. Something can happen to the pen, it can, uh, the ink can be gone out of it, it isn't touching the... Get in here too. Okay, come on in there, John. All right, so what we've got now, this is our overflow, we've got this off. Okay, you're going to turn the steam valve on. T turn it right on. Okay, now your steam's coming through your controller. We've got the, the valve on the bottom side open, and what you're doing now is you're dropping all the moisture in your line coming out, and you're draining that off. Okay, now the moisture's out. Now you see your bleed valve start working, okay? Now I'm gonna open up this valve here. John, go ahead and reach over, don't get burnt. Reach over and open this, this is your bypass. Okay, now what you've just done, you went by the controller and you're putting solid steam in. See how fast it's coming up? All right, wait till it gets about 18. And then you're gonna open it up. Okay, it's coming, okay, go ahead, open it up. Open it slow. Alright, keep opening them. Open them all the way up. Keep it all up. Now you'll start your time right now. Keep it all up. Now you'll start your time right now. You'll put five minutes down, you write that down. You're running about seven pounds pressure right now. Look at your thermometer down here. Okay, what you got down there on pressure? Temperature. Should have about 235. Is it for 235 on there? What is it? 245. 245 on there? Oh yeah, it's climbing up. So you're going about, yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's climbing up now, and it's going to hold right there. It'll hold right in this area. Alright, now come over and check your thermometer over here. Your chart. Okay, now, okay, we're just doing our time right, okay, now, if your, your five minutes is up, now first thing you're going to do when that five minutes is up is shut this valve first, put everything through this controller, and go ahead and shut that valve. Okay, now, everything is going through here, now shut your vent, shut it right down. Okay, now, now you're, 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 you're controlling your steam pressure now. You always shut this valve off first before you do that. Now watch this thing come up. Now it's gonna come up. Okay, now see it's starting back off because this controller's taking over. See the controller opening up? Okay, now what it's gonna do is it's gonna settle down and now it's gonna run, it, it, it'll run within a half a degree. Is that accurate? So it'll run and it, it's an air pressure controller. So it'll run within a half a degree. Now the time is up, you got your, your, your cook time is on. You chart that down for 75 minutes. You're going to cook this for 75 minutes. At the end of 75 minutes, you set your steam off, exhaust your retort, and you're done. You start another basket. Got another basket in there. Stop this to work. You guys can stand around this, see? Yeah. So put this back here and we can stand over here. Well, no, I think. Uh, I'll, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Now here's, uh, these are strips that they've made. And uh, this, these will be taken and, and uh, canned. And it'll be just like the product that you're seeing inside there, the canned products. Uh, these are only put in a smokehouse for eight hours and we can dry them because this is a horizontal flow smokehouse. It puts 12,000 cubic feet of air a minute to this. So it's a very, very high air pressure. But you can see it dries this stuff right down in just a matter of eight hours time. And we can take it on down to it's very, very dry, but then we don't want to can it. We want to keep a little moisture in it how we're canning it. And we see the oil content is still coming out. You can see the oil here dripping even. There's lots of oil. This is king salmon out of Cook Inlet. Their king salmon will be a lot more uh, heavier than that. Then with the collars, 
instead of taking the collars and cutting them real short, because we can, there's a big market for them, we cut the collars long uh, because there's a very, very good money in these. And they call them salmon wings. And we leave the fin right on and, and uh, we sell them like that there. They cry back them in a package and uh, they, they look really nice when you get a cry back and uh, you sell them just like that. And there's a, there's a huge market for these because they're all, they're, they're a lot of oil in the, in the, the collars here. Okay. Uh, so what, we're, what we usually do is uh, that we'll trade them on all of this different products that we're doing and uh, they will spend two weeks here how they're being trained. Uh, through canning, uh, smoking, uh, uh, pickling fish, and different things like that, fillet, from filleting right on through everything, uh, fresh canned fish, and, and locks. We're, we'll be doing locks this afternoon. And, uh, and then what they do is once they get back to their own area, if they build a plant and stuff, then we come out and spend one week with them, or whatever it takes, and uh, work with them and get their lines set up and get their product out. So they're actually putting product through their plant. And then we give them on, uh, on support from then on, we do support with them for the next three or four years, whatever they need us. Like in Monic, uh, we're, we're gonna work with them for the next four or five years. So any problems they have, uh, and we, the, the equipment they got, we keep a list here at Indian Valley. So if there's anything that breaks down, they can call me and I can get it up here within a day or so and get it out to them. Do you think so, the size of an operation is, a, is about the right size for a village? I, I do, I think as the smaller operations uh, keep the, the capital investment down and uh, you can employ a few people out there anywhere from 8 to 15 people and make it very profitable and that's the whole thing keep the size of the operation down the overhead down and, and their power out there I realize is more more expensive than it is here in town but we, we discussed that we've done a lot of cutting tests with them and uh, show them how to figure their percentages and stuff and one thing that they have that I don't is they have the, the raw material right there on the ground so we've done a cutting test this morning, for instance, on, on uh, uh, regular uh, uh, strips. And they can save a dollar on the raw price, which these come out about 34% uh, recovery. So when you take that dollar on the raw price, that adds up to about $3 on, on the finished product. So there's where they can really, really make their money on that. And the shipping, uh, as far as shipping goes, is about the same as what I pay here from, from uh, Seattle up they get about the same shipping. Shipping from, from uh, Umnak on where we sent all of our reindeer in, on, we sent it on coastal and we got that back to, to Seattle for six cents a pound. So the, the backhaul shipping is, is